Has the news ever been more full of stories about people who are not what they seem to be? You probably saw last week that Scott Thompson, the relatively new CEO of Yahoo, had to step down after only four or five months on the job. Why? Because he had falsified his resume. Here he is at the top of the food chain in the corporate world, and he had lied about a, uh, a college degree that he had never earned. But you may not have noticed, although some of you may have seen the story that was riding below the surface of the main stories of the week. Last week, a TSA security officer, that's the guys at the airport that are making sure that we're all safe and there's no terrorists slipping through. Last week, a TSA officer at Newark's Liberty Airport, an airport I've been through several times, a guy who's charged with protecting all of us, keeping us all safe, a man who has worked for TSA for several years, has 30 other TSA agents under him, was discovered that he has been pretending to be somebody else and has perpetrated an identity theft for 20 years. He has been claiming for the last two decades to be Jerry Thomas, a man who died 20 years ago. It has now been determined that this man that is checking our security at the airport was actually in the country, is in the country illegally, and has been working illegally since 1989. But he's cleared all the security checks, had the badge, and was in charge of several other officers at the airport in Newark. If he's convicted, he faces 10 years in prison. You know, the reality is things are just not always what they appear to be. Maybe the author J.G. Ballard was right when he said, we live in a world ruled by fictions of every kind. You know, even in church, people are not what they ought to be, and sometimes people are not even sincere, but God is still looking for sincere and pure hearts. And this morning, as we continue in our study, the mighty acts of God, I want us to look together at an authentic Christian life. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to Acts, the 19th chapter. Acts chapter 19, you'll find this on page 1099 in the Bible provided at the pew rack. I want us to begin reading this morning at verse 11. The Bible says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. You know, have you ever had a dog chase you while you're driving down the road? Have you ever heard the question, what would a dog do if it ever caught the car? Well, these seven phonies one day met a real demon. And then what? Well, it turned out bad for them. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, there's nothing funny about demon possession, but there is something humorous about the way Luke writes this story. You can just see these guys scattering out of the house, all stripped down and bleeding and, and uh, running in every direction, and all because they met a real-life demon that had possessed a man, and when they tried this artificial hocus-pocus religion, it was like the demon said, what are you bringing this weak stuff into my neighborhood for? Jesus, I know. Paul, I know about. Who are you? And yet this all turned out to God's glory because the next verse says, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of Jesus was held in high honor. You know, people don't always tell the truth. Things are not always the way they seem, and we're used to it. We're getting used, to living in, or getting used to living in a world of lies. In fact, even popular music talks about it. A few years ago, Billy Joel had this song where, the, where one of the lines was, and don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> Resume normal breathing. But the line in the song is, honesty is such a lonely word, 
Everyone is so untrue. Even in the world we live in, we're used to people uh, representing themselves in an artificial way. Well, in New Testament times, it was not uncommon for people to take advantage of the problems of a culture and represent themselves as, as exorcists, as people who had the power to drive out evil spirits, and they would come to town, and for a price, they would, you know, shake a bone or, you know, light some incense or, you know, rattle off some exotic-sounding religious incantations as long as it was cash up front. And that's exactly what was happening here in this passage of Scripture. There were a group of men who were literally taking advantage of others. I don't know if you've ever lived around an addictive personality. Maybe you grew up in the home of an alcoholic or a drug addict, or maybe as a parent you've dealt with a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction of a child or a spouse. And when you're in that situation, there is almost nothing you won't do to get your loved one into counseling or rehab. There's almost no price you're not willing to pay. But think about this first century when they didn't have the advantages that we have today and the prevalence of demon possession that is referred to in the New Testament. A city like Ephesus, a major commercial center in the uh, Roman Empire, a place that was well known for its involvement in the occult, in the magic arts, and this place was a place where the demons had had almost full reign. It was like the devil was the king of the streets in Ephesus. But when Paul came to town, he started preaching in the name of Jesus, and the demons were subject to the name of Jesus. And so this group of seven brothers from a prestigious Jewish family, they thought, well, we'll go into this town where all these families are suffering, and, you know, they're bound to pay us something. Because if they've got a son or a daughter that's possessed by an evil spirit and, and their lives are being destroyed by evil, well, they'll pay almost anything they have in order to get out of that mess. And so we'll demand cash up front. We'll go in and we'll rattle some bones or light some incense, definitely r rattle off some religious-sounding words. Well, that's the way it was back then. And I want you to know something. Today, there are still some self-serving frauds, but God is still looking for sincere faith from you and me. Now, I want you to notice that God was moving in a powerful way. This wasn't just, there wasn't just fakes around. There was some, God was moving. In fact, look at verse 11. It's a very interesting passage. Look at it. The Bible says God was doing some extraordinary miracles through Paul extraordinary miracles. Now, on the surface, without thinking about it, that may even sound a little redundant because, after all, a miracle is by its nature something out of the ordinary. I mean, if it was ordinary, it wouldn't be a miracle. It would be an everyday occurrence. A miracle, by its very definition, is something that doesn't ordinarily take place. But this passage of Scripture goes a step above that. It ramps up miracles to another level because the Bible here says that God was doing not just miracles by the hand of Paul, but extraordinary miracles. And that word extraordinary is actually a word which refers to the sport of archery or throwing a javelin in the Olympics when someone was able to hit the bullseye every time. They were a professional marksman, somebody that never missed. This was a word which described an extraordinary skill, not like the run of the mill, not the ordinary in any way. And the Bible says extraordinary miracles, miracles even beyond that which those who had seen miracles had come to expect were taking place in the city of Ephesus. Verse 12 tells us what those extraordinary miracles were, what they looked like. Notice the Bible says that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul when taken to the sick uh, were curing their illnesses and driving out evil spirits. Now, the Bible says handkerchiefs. That's a real nice word. But literally in Greek, it's the word sweat rag. <laughs> yeah. Paul was, a, he, he was bivocational. He had a job. And, uh, you know, he, Turkey is a hot climate. 
I've been to Turkey in the summer, and I've been there in the winter. It's hot all the time. Every time I'm there, it's sunshine, and it's warm, short sleeves. I mean, it is a warm climate. Paul was there two years in the city of Ephesus. He's out there working in that blazing hot sun, making tents, working with canvas and leather, and working uh, himself, you know, uh, uh, for a living. And literally, he would wear a headband, keep the sweat out of his eyes. And at the end of a long day, he'd come in, throw that sweaty headband off. Somebody would grab it up, put it on a sick person, they'd get well. I'm telling you, we don't see that kind of thing in the New Testament very often. The only thing that compares to it, remember Jesus was walking through a crowd of people and a a poor lady just reached out and touched the hem of his garment and the power of God flowed through him and healed her. And he turned around and said, who touched me? I felt the power go through me. But only that one time in the miracle uh, life, in the life of Jesus, do we see anything like this, except for that one other time in Acts chapter 5 when even the shadow of Peter would bring about miracles. There were times when God did extraordinary things. And in this passage of Scripture, we see extraordinary displays of the power of God. And yet, how many of you know when God starts moving, the enemy feels threatened? And the heart of this story is the story of spiritual warfare. Because while Paul was doing extraordinary work for God, while God was delivering people from sin and the oppression of the enemy, the reality is the enemy was still hard at work. And so there were a group of men who were artificial in every way. Now, it's interesting. The last time we looked at the book of Acts was the week before Mother's Day. Two weeks ago, we looked at a passage of Scripture which led, uh, was the first few verses of chapter 19. Do you remember that story? That was when Paul met 12 disciples of John the Baptist. Do you remember that? And he said, whose baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism. And he said, John's baptism baptism was the baptism of repentance. From that, he preached Jesus, and they were baptized under the authority or in the name of Jesus. Do you remember us talking about that? In that case, we see an error which is common in the body of Christ, and that is an error of the head, but not of the heart. These men were genuine and sincere, but they had a lack of teaching, and they didn't have the full understanding of what the Word teaches. And so they had made an error, but it wasn't an error of mischief or an error of deliberately trying to do the wrong thing. They just didn't have the information. Now the Bible gives us a second error, which, by the way, is almost as common, if not perhaps more common in the body of Christ, and that's the error not of the head, but an error of the heart. These are people who have no intentions of obeying. They have no intentions of doing what is right. They are only in it for the money. They're only in it for themselves. As a matter of fact, look what verse 13 says. The Bible says they tried to invoke the name of Jesus. That phrase, tried to invoke, is literally a phrase in Greek which means take with the hand. In other words, they had chosen for themselves this this authority. They were doing this uh, uh, upon their own authority. God didn't call them into this work. They were fakes and phonies, and, and they were only in it for the money. And the Bible says in verse 13, they would say, I command you. And that phrase, I command you, shows just how little they understood because it literally means we're trying to force you to take an oath. I mean, as if you can speak to a demon and say, do you promise to leave this guy alone? They were all talk. They were ritual versus reality. They were all professional, but no power. Brothers and sisters, the spiritual warfare that you and I are going to face this week will probably look much different than the spiritual warfare that these men were dealing with. In those days, the the enemy had so overwhelmed this person, whoever he was, that it was obvious that there was demonic activity taking place in his life. How many of you know that most of what you face this week is not going to be, you know, uh, like an exorcist movie. It's not going to be like you're going to walk into work tomorrow and even if you think your boss is demon-possessed, he's not going to be levitating over the desk. It's not going to be quite that obvious. Even if somebody in your family you're pretty sure is full of the devil, their head's not going to be spinning around. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
No, the spiritual warfare that you and I are going to be dealing with in the United States of America in the 21st century is just as real, but it may be far more sinister than the overt displays of demonic activity that we read about in the Gospels and in the book of Acts because the spiritual warfare that you and I deal with is a subtle spiritual warfare where the enemy speaks into our spirits and whispers into our ear and suggests to us, don't do it God's way. That's too hard. Take an easier route. Why don't you just shave the corners? Why don't you just do this one time? Not many people are going to notice, and even those who do have done far worse, and they're not going to really care. And the reality is you and I live in a city, and we live in a culture, and often we live inside family life where we can live far below the stated standards of God for our life and nobody really seems to care. In fact, it's the opposite. If you start standing out for Jesus, that's when you're going to take the flack. You can continue to live a low-grade temperature spirituality and this world will let you get dominated by little decisions made at important moments where you decide not to stand strong and not to be true and little by little your influence for Christ and your personal integrity is whittled away not by some massive Hollywood display of demonism but by the little decisions of compromise that we make in secret every single day. And the issue of spiritual warfare is just as real today for you when you have to deal with those temptations that have been nagging at you for months or years. The spiritual warfare you're going to have to deal with this week is just as real as the spiritual warfare in Ephesus that day when a demon-possessed man overpowered seven other men. The difference is, for most of us, the spiritual warfare will be in keeping those sins secret that we've been hiding for far too long because we refuse to come to Jesus to admit that we are woefully inadequate without his help. In fact, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And for most of us, keeping our secret sins secret and never dealing with them while the enemy erodes our personal and spiritual integrity is the bigger challenge to you and me. And yet, all the time, we go to church, we talk the talk, we know exactly what to say. But how many of you know when it comes down to the reality of spiritual living, when you really need to call upon the help of God and the power of God to help you live the Christian life, it's not more religious talk you need it's not more ritual. It's the power of the Holy Spirit of God living the life of Christ through you that you really need and that really is going to make the difference when you confront the enemy who's confronting you. Amen. Many of you have probably never heard of the name Ed Gilbreth. He's a, an uh, editor for Christianity Today magazine, a Christian author, and a Christian speaker. And this African-American, by his own testimony, has spent most of his life living near, working with, and worshiping with white evangelicals. And a few years ago, he wrote a book on racial reconciliation called The Reconciliation Blues. He was working with promise keepers, trying to help Christian men across racial lines come together and understand one another and help one another and represent Christ better? Well, long before he was a well-known Christian leader, this young man, only been in the ministry for about three years, got a call from, and he tells about in his book, from a white uh, evangelical Christian leader. He doesn't mention his name or his church or his denomination, but the implication is that most other Christians would know who it was. And can you imagine a young guy just starting out in ministry gets a phone call from a, a major Christian leader and asks him if he would meet with him for lunch. So he gets together with him, still not understanding why he would be called to meet with this white evangelical Christian leader. And when they get together for lunch, this man that he doesn't even know begins to confess racism. 
You can make us confess that he's a racist and that, you know, he works with a bunch of racists and that the people in the denomination, you know, that he works in are racist. And he says, while we invite you, meaning other black ministers, while we invite you to the table within our denomination, he said, the reality is the decisions have already been made and we're just doing it for show. And all of a sudden this man starts crying and Ed is sitting there thinking to himself, what is going on here? What is really happening I mean, this guy calls me out of nowhere and starts telling me all this stuff and crying. And he says, how are we ever going to get over this? And how can we be friends? That's what the white guy says to Ed Gilbreth. How, how are we going to move past all this? How are you going to help me with this? How can we be friends? Ed sat there for a minute. And he said, do you like football? And, and the guy looked kind of stunned. He said, well, yeah, I like football. He said, well, I do too. He said, matter of fact, he said, I was a high school football coach and a college football coach. And he said, I've known some guys that have gone on to the pros. He said, there's nothing I love more than, you know, grilling some steaks on a Sunday afternoon and sitting down and watching a good game with some of my friends. So I tell you what, if you want to work through some of these issues, why don't we do this? Why don't, why don't I grill some steaks over at my place and and you come over one Sunday afternoon, and we'll watch a game together. And this white guy goes, you want me to come to your house? And Ed goes, well, yeah. Friendship is not cheap. It requires a commitment. He said, here's my number. Give me a call. <laughs> he said, I never heard from him again. Now, Ed Gilbreth did not try to define what that leader's real motive was in getting together with him for that lunch. But the clear implication is this. Whatever his motivation was, it was all talk. Because when it came down to really doing something about what he said he really cared about, he wasn't willing to do it. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, I don't know what the temptation you're facing looks like, but I do know this, spiritual warfare and authentic Christian living always calls for something more than just talk. It's easy to talk a good game, but living the Christian life requires so much more. I want you to notice, in fact, that an authentic Christian life requires not only the talk, but I want you to notice that an authentic Christian life requires a real walk with Jesus. Look at verse 15. Not only the talk, but would you notice verse 15, it requires a walk. The Bible says, one day the evil spirit answered them, hello, they weren't ready for this. They've been playing games with religion so long. This is the last thing apparently they expected. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? <laughs> you know, if you're a phony religionist, this is your worst nightmare. That you have gotten some family to pay you up front so you can cast out an evil spirit and you're going to go do your religious thing, wave your incense around, you know, spew out some religious-sounding incantations, use some big names like, you know, Jesus, Paul, all the big guys, and all of a sudden an evil spirit talks back. That's just about the last thing they expected. And they said, Jesus, I know. I know about Paul, but who are you? Oh, I guarantee you they knew Jesus. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that he descended into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive. Now, brothers and sisters, good people that love the Bible disagree on the interpretation of that passage. But I'll tell you, I'm happy to tell you what I believe. I believe when the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that if he ascended on high, what is it that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive? I'll tell you what I believe with all my heart. I believe that during those hours when Jesus' body was laying cold and, and, and developing rigor mortis in that tomb 
over that weekend in Jerusalem, the soul of Jesus descended into hell. And you say, why in the world would Jesus go to hell? I'll tell you why, brothers and sisters, because for too long, hell had been the prince of darkness. Hell had been the authority on this earth. But the Bible says that Jesus went to hell and said, there's a new sheriff in town. And the Bible says he led captivity captive. He took control of the jail, and he rode over hell under new management. That's why he told his disciples, even the enemy, even the serpents, even the demons will be subject to my name. The Bible says that while we do not yet see all things under his feet, there is coming a day when every knee shall bow and every, tongues, uh, every tongue will confess of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, I guarantee you they knew Jesus. When they said Jesus, I know, they meant we know who he is. Then they said something else that's very intriguing. They said, and we know about Paul. Now, this word, we know about him, that's an excellent translation. What they're saying here is, we know Jesus big time, firsthand knowledge, there's no doubt. But then they use another word that means we are very familiar also with the Apostle Paul. You know, more than 35 years ago, when I was first starting my ministry, I read a book that has become the most influential book outside the Bible I've ever read. It's not the best written book. It's not the most re well-researched book. But it is by far the most influential book I've ever read, Why Revival Tarries by Leonard Ravenhill. When I was a young guy starting out in the ministry, I'd read like a page of it, and I'd sit it down and say, whew, i got to take some of that in. It took me a while to read the book because I could only read about a page at a time, and then I'd have to get under conviction and repent of something. The last chapter in that book, the title of the chapter is Known in Hell. And the author advocates that in this situation, we see a man so totally sold out to the lordship of Christ, so utterly unconcerned about his own personal ambitions and personal reputation, so unconcerned about his own personal life that he had literally woken hell up to the reality that he was there to represent Jesus. And as a young man, I began to think, you know what? I want Jesus to know who I am because that's how I'm going to get to heaven. I want the people around me to know I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't want there to be any doubt among other believers that I love the Lord. I want those who don't know Jesus to know I know Jesus. But after reading that book 35 years ago, I said, Lord, I want to be known in hell I want it to be such that every morning the devil gets a few of his top people together and says, hey, look out, he's awake. <laughs> Child of God, we need a reputation not only in heaven, we need a reputation in hell. The Bible says Paul had a reputation in hell. The devil said, Jesus I know, Paul I know about. He said, who are you? You can just see this devil trash talking these sons of Sceva. What are you bringing this weak game into my neighborhood? It's my playground. You take it on out of here. Don't come back. Child of God, listen to me. They had the talk, but they didn't have the walk. And brothers and sisters, it is so easy for us to criticize others who we can observe of being highly ritualistic and say they're the ones that the scripture is speaking about and speaking to. But my brothers and sisters, there's something else going on right here. The reality is this is a word of warning to those of us who stand for Christ. This is a word of warning for those of us who name the name of Jesus. Let's make sure that we're not living our lives such that our talk is excellent, but our walk is inferior. They said, Jesus I know, 
Paul, he's made his dent, but who are you? You know, the reality is there are counterfeits in this world. Ray Steadman, the Bible teacher of the 20th century, once said, surely the most subtle strategy ever devised by Satan to deceive and mislead people is that of leading Christians to live a sham Christianity before the world, end of quote. Brothers and sisters, what the world needs is to see Jesus as he really is. And if the world is going to see Jesus as he really is. You and I are going to be the advocates, and we're going to be the presenters of Jesus, and we need the real thing in our lives. Because, brothers and sisters, although it doesn't seem like it all the time, the real always overrides the phony. The authentic always defeats the artificial. Years ago, a couple of groups of family members went to supper with a guy, and I was there, and uh, he was taking a trip. He'd come to see several of his friends and family, and a lot of friends had gotten together, and he said, I want to show you guys something. And he pulled out a $20 bill, and he said, he, he handed me a $20 bill. He said, do you see anything unusual? I was in college. I hadn't seen a $20 bill in a while. I said, other than the fact I don't see them very often. I said, no, I, I don't. It looks like a $20 bill to me. He said, look at this one. Then he pulled out another $20 bill, and everybody was looking. I was looking. And he said, what does that scroll say on the back? And on the back of the $20 bill, it says, in God we trust. He said, look at that first one more carefully. And then all of a sudden, we realized that the phrase, the motto, in God we trust, was not on that first 20. He said, I said, what is this? He said, it's a counterfeit $20 bill. I said, where did you get it? He said, when I went to the bank to cash a check before I took this trip, the bank passed me some counterfeit 20s. Now, after 35 years of thinking about that story, I'm not so sure that story is, I'm not really sure where he got those, hard, those counterfeit 20s. <laughs> but, you know, I don't really know where he got them, and I don't really want to know, but he was showing us some counterfeit 20s that night. And he was saying that the bank passed him to him. And he said, now what do I do? He said, carrying around counterfeit money, this is a crime. He said, how do I even go to him and tell him I've got it? I don't know what he did. But I do know this, those counterfeits, to, to those of us sitting at that table, we weren't looking closely enough at those counterfeits to notice those little differences, the subtle differences. You know, today the United States is going to, you know how much we're going to spend this year Printing money? You know, it costs money to print money. We're going to spend 700, listen to this, we're going to spend $750 million this year as a government printing money. And part of the reason for that is that in the digital age, counterfeiting has never been easier for the dishonest than it is today. And so, as a result, uh, our government has to use a different material. We have to put different types of uh, watermarks and new colors. And you know, all the presidents have gotten a facelift on all the bills lately. And the reality is, you could probably show me a counterfeit $20 bill today, and I'd be even less likely to recognize it because it looks like new money to me anyway. I don't know what color it's going to be next week. And have you ever noticed now, you know, they got those watermarks in the, in the bills, and uh, if you hold them up to the light, you can see the president's face in the watermark. What is it that leads you to give a 20 to somebody at a gas station? And they, what are they, like an FBI agent, you know, and they, you hand them a, I keep thinking, is it something in, about me that makes them want to take my 20 and hold it up to the light? But the counterfeits look so real but they're not real. Brothers and sisters, the temptation of our life this week, for most of us, is not going to be that we go out here and just ruin our Christian life in some spectacular fashion. The temptation of our Christian life this week 
is going to be that the world is going to subtly whisper, subtly whisper into our ear, look, it's not going to matter if you shave the corners off just a little. We're going to hear a familiar but sinister whisper into our conscience that says, look, just compromise this one time. Nobody's going to know. And those that do know are guilty of far worse. And it really won't matter. And the temptation of the Christian life in the 21st century for you and me is not some spectacular flame out when we ruin our lives in some public display of stupidity, the worst temptation are going to be those little decisions that we make in the privacy and the secrecy of our lives. When we compromise away our convictions, not in a grandstand, but in single steps, one after the other, that eventually lead to our destruction. Brothers and sisters, how many of you know today that in an authentic Christian life, it's not just the talk you talk, it's about the walk you walk.